Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me down here. There's no snow here. It's great. There was rain. Very nice yesterday. So uh, good to escape Boston. I think the snow in front of the house is now down to six feet, which is a uh, oh, the snow in front of the house is now to six feet. So that's a uh, that's an improvement, and I hope it keeps improving until June when everything will be gone. Um, today I'm going to talk about. Uh, so there are two talks that I get to give here. One today, one tomorrow. Um, and the first talk's title is uh, Tissue Regeneration. Uh, second talk's title uh, is uh, Organ Engineering or Bioartificial Organs. I'll try to span that spectrum in those two talks. Uh, why are we thinking about this? As you know, medicine has changed, and here's, of course, I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, medicine has changed in a way that we survive acute events better, um, that uh, patients make it through heart attacks and trauma, uh, but they end up with tissue damage. Uh, that's overwhelming, and that tissue damage leads to uh, end organ failure. This is just the uh, incidence of heart failure versus mortality in heart and coronary artery disease, and it, it, it just shows that you know we're dealing with more and more patients that are older and that are uh, suffering from end organ failure for which we have rather limited options such as mechanical support systems or transplantation. And uh, you know, the face to reality for all of us sitting in this room, the chance for each and one of us to develop end organ failure of some sort that needs organ replacement treatment is about 20%. Now, of course, uh, the ultimate organ failure is death, so it's inevitable that everybody develops organ failure, but organ failure that will impact your quality of life um, and will require something like hemodialysis or um, treatment for heart failure or end-stage lung disease. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that, we know that uh, uh, as I mentioned, current options are limited uh, and that transplant numbers uh, and numbers of support systems don't really match up with the number of patients that we're facing. Uh, if you just uh, get out of our field for a second, if you think of end-stage renal disease, there's about 500,000 Americans on hemodialysis right now, which I think uh, shows you where we are. You know, this is a treatment that has a, a yearly mortality of 25%. It costs $80,000 a year, uh, and, and really, only very few of them have, an, have the outlook to ever get an organ. So it's a substantial, sort of a quiet problem, but a substantial problem that affects quality of life, affects the ability to go to work. Uh, you know, hemodialysis is a good example. You sit in, in a center for three days a week um, for a couple hours or more uh, and really are not able to return you to your life. And, and if you take heart failure and stage lung disease, it's just the same. So it is a little bit of a pie in the sky topic, but it's something that becomes much more relevant and much more realistic in the NIH. Has, has recognized that. So this is a quote from Rosemary Hunziger that uh, she's the director of the NIBIB. She put that up about five years ago on her homepage, um, describing regenerative medicine as a process of creating uh, living functional tissue that has the potential, or those tissues that have the potential to solve the problem of donor organ shortage. And I, I put this quote up because I like Rosemary and because I think that, that was at a time where there weren't any uh, artificial organ networks set up yet and, uh, uh, and there wasn't really much going on in terms of funding of these stem cell derived uh, tissue engineering, organ engineering projects. Uh, but the need was recognized and since then multiple RFAs have been put out to try to push, push the envelope on this topic. So what I'm gonna talk about uh, today, in the first part, is to uh, a couple thoughts on regeneration. Since the topic is t tissue regeneration, that title, title was given to me, but I think it's very wisely chosen, because not just engineering, but really what we're trying to do is regeneration. Um, I'll talk about the principles of tissue engineering, and I'll talk about the first steps towards bioartificial organs or bioengineered organs that we've made so far. The talk tomorrow will then uh, take you a little more towards clinical applicability uh, and tell you about recent progress toward patient-derived cells and towards bioartificial human organs. And I brought some unpublished data that I hope uh, you'll find interesting. So if you talk about regeneration, the, the model animal that everybody uh, has, look, has been looking at are, are of course lower level animals such as amphibians that are able to regenerate. And then bring this up, this is the red spotted newt, it's a small little animal that um, we would think is not very complex. It doesn't have a lot of capabilities. It doesn't use iPhones or, or, or do surgery. But it does something that we all cannot do. It's able to regenerate its limbs. So if you cut off an arm, it will regrow it. And I think it's been a little bit, um, um, how do I say, uh, it, interesting that we looked at this as a process that is, has been developed very early on and that is, is, is sort of harbored in our genetic code. That is something that we just forgot how to do 
but really we all did it uh, throughout revolution and dropped it. Well, there's a paper in Nature Genetics last year, um, actually the, the initial data set was published in 2013, that I think is humbling because it turns out the new genome is actually 10 times more complex than the human genome. And it could be that this is evolution at work uh, showing us that, you know, while we're getting smarter and smarter, nature is actually trying to figure out through evolution ways to make animals survive and regenerate. And it could be something that is actually not harbored in our genome. So regeneration in the newt is dependent on about a thousand gene products that don't even exist in our genome. Um, I, I'm bringing this up because, you know, there were, there were papers and there's this enthusiasm to eventually come up with the magic juice that will grow a limb back or grow a heart back in a patient. It's something that in this form might just not happen because we don't have that piece of information in our genome. We're not built that way. Nevertheless, an interesting model to look at. When we, when we moved to mammals, there was a science paper in 2011 that showed very nicely that uh, mammals are able to regenerate tissue uh, up to the early perinatal period. And, and this is a paper where, um, where the scientists cut off the apex of a mouse heart. And what they showed, if, if you do this within the first week postnatally, the mouse is actually able to regenerate the tissue locally and regrow that heart. So it's not full-blown newt regeneration, but it is regeneration of architecture and functional tissue at a site of resection or a site of amputation. Of course, if you cut out the entire heart, like if you, in a newt or in a zebrafish, if you cut out half the heart, they'll regenerate it. Mice don't do that, but still the apex of that heart regenerated. What's interesting is that if you did that in postnatal week two, it didn't happen. And this is basically where we all are, right? If you have a heart attack, if you have an injury, uh, regeneration doesn't happen. And you see that histology here is very much consistent with any sort of heart failure model. Um, the, the tissue did not regenerate, it formed a scar. If we move further along, there are examples where we are able to regenerate. And as surgeons, we know that pretty well. Um, in the pediatric population, this is more pronounced. So this is a good example of uh, a necrotizing pneumonia. This is a, an old paper from Children's Hospital showing that uh, necrotizing pneumonia in a four-year-old leads to extensive tissue destruction, uh, loss of function, and that within nine months, this can actually regenerate back to a fairly normal appearing lung tissue. So there are a few examples, and I'll go into these, where our tissues are actually to, able to regenerate. You know, again, if, if you cut off your arm, it will not grow back. But especially the surfaces towards the outer world, such as the respiratory epithelium uh, or the gut, are interesting because there we do regenerate, uh, and otherwise we wouldn't be able to survive. So I'm going to look at, for a couple of slides into the respiratory epithelium. And as you see here, uh, the, the respiratory epithelium regenerates as a, on, a, on a daily basis. This is, this is what it looks like. It's made of, of a basal membrane, and I'll talk about that a little more, and a mix of cells. And these are the ciliated cells that in smokers go away. And these are submucosal glands. Uh, and, and there's a, a very carefully designed homeostatic system that maintains these tissues. What happens in injury is that the, t the cells are lost. So this is like an inhalational burn or, uh, let's say, cystic fibrosis or, or heavy smoking. T the cells are lost. The basement membrane is preserved. And a few of these cells prevail. These are basal cells. And what these basal cells then do is they start to turn over and turn into the respiratory epithelium. So within a few, uh, a few days, weeks after this injury, uh, the respiratory epithelium repairs itself, regenerates, if you will. Now that is possible because there's stem cells there. And this is the first important component or the key player in regeneration. There are stem cells there, and whether you call them stem cells or progenitor cells is, is semantics at this point uh, in, the, in the presentation. But the bottom line is there's a cell there that's able to change, that, to do two things, able to change its own fate and grow into something else, so turn into a ciliated cell, and it's able to self-renew. So, so these five cells actually turn, uh, turn into ciliated cell and um, basal cell to reconstitute the pool. And that's complex, that's not infinite. We know that uh, in COPD patients, these basal cells get very tired over time. But they are able, over the course of our life, to reconstitute their pool and to differentiate into other things. The second really important component of regeneration, uh, of tissue regeneration that we do on a daily basis, is the niche. That's an important term, and we'll get back to that. So stem cells are required, and these stem cells require an intact niche that's made up of extracellular matrix proteins, that's made up of specific cells that feed into that niche, 
basically a homing uh, location for these cells to sit in. So if you take basal cells and you inject them under the skin, they don't form respiratory epithelium, right? That doesn't work. These cells need a very specific environment. This is a paper of Mark, uh, Frank McKeon that uh, he was actually in, at the CF meeting yesterday in, um, in Washington that showed very nicely in Nature last year that, that this is actually happening and these cells are doing this. This is what I just told you in the slide before is proven in this paper and a couple more Nature papers that came out last fall uh, by lineage tracing. So basically you create a mouse that, uh, that uh, allows you to label these basal cells and then you can label any lung that came from these basal cells in blue. And what it shows, nine days post-infection with an influenza virus, so you infected these mice with H1N1, nine days, 15 days, 60 days after serious influenza, uh, large parts of that lung were actually, or the epithelium were replaced by um, uh, by uh, these uh, cells derived from these basal cells. So this is happening. This is the bottom line of this slide. However, as most of you know, if there's an overwhelming injury, such as uh, heart attack, such as um, um, long standing injury in COPD, in cystic fibrosis, in interstitial fibrosis, we don't regenerate tissue. We actually form scar, uh, which is a, uh, an inferior repair uh, reaction. Uh, this scar has different materials, different mechanical properties, and has nothing to do with the original tissue. And this is very much uh, related. Uh, again, if you look at this, uh, this is a heart failure pig, an MRI of a heart failure pig that I did when I was at the University of Minnesota. I just occluded the LAD, uh, and it ended up developing heart failure over the next six weeks. And you can see, if you look at this, uh, the scar here that it's entirely different from tissues that we're able to regenerate, right? There's no more uh, uh, stem cells in there that are left over. There's no more niche, meaning that environment, that matrix has changed in its entirety, uh, and there's loss of architecture and function in the end. So we're not able to bounce back from that uh, by regenerating it, and I'm not going to get into that, but if you consider these aspects, it makes sense why we're not able to bounce back from that by just injecting cells into, into that scar. Now, if we go over key events in regeneration, going back to the nude, uh, there's injury, there's inflammation, there's cleanup, there's sta stabilization and regeneration of matrix that wasn't there before. This is something we can't do. There's stem cell dedifferentiation, expansion, and then redifferentiation. This is also something we can't do. Um, there's re restoration of perfusion, then architecture, then function. And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, highlighting these points is because despite the fact that we can't do these in vivo, I'm going to show you some data where I think we're getting to a point where some of these things we can actually do in vitro to grow artificial organs. So how can we regenerate tissue? The way to regenerate tissue, or a lot of this goes back to Bob Langer and Jay Vacanti's paper in 1993 uh, in science where they showed that you can engineer tissue, uh, uh, you can apply the, the principles of engineering to life science and engineer tissue to augment or replace lost tissue function. And that was a good, uh, a good PR um, uh, going around the world, a rat basically with a human ear on its back. Now, after that, not much happened because a lot of other fields had to do a lot of catching up. Um, but what it showed was the principle of tissue engineering that you can combine a matrix scaffold which in a more advanced way is, is your specific niche, combine that with cells, perform some sort of tissue or organ assembly ex vivo, and then end up with something that can be transplanted. And what has happened since then? So myocardial tissue engineering, I'm pulling this up as an example, but of course the field has evolved since 1993, and uh, starting from early experiments with uh, chick embryo extracts here, in the 90s people figured out that that occurs and that if you combine, in this case, cardiomyocytes with extracellular matrix, with collagen in this case, um, and then mechanically stimulate these constructs. So you take these constructs through a tissue regeneration process, if you will, you end up with tissue that can function, provide contractile function. If you make that stimulation more complex, more advanced, you end up with tissue that functions even better, uh, has appropriate architecture, and can be implanted uh, in animals to improve function. Now, what's the crux of this? And that's when I, I started to think about it. The crux of this is that the tissue at the time did not have any perfusible channels, right? It did not have any vascular system. So transplanting a 200 micron heart patch onto a heart failure heart sounds very nice, but that's about the limit of diffusion. Um, but it doesn't really make a, a humongous difference. If you think of a kidney, uh, a lung, other organs, I mean, human scale is a challenge in itself. So the question was in 2004, what's the best way to create an organ matrix? 
that was the major challenge. Um, up till then, a lot of progress has been made already. So this is Chris Brewer's paper showing that you can actually, using artificial matrix scaffolds as vascular grafts, you can put them in patients, they engraft, they stay pa patent over time. Uh, not only do they do that, but they actually grow with the patient. So encouraging early pushes into clinical application. I'll take one minute to talk about that niche that I mentioned before and the matrix. You know, at the, in 2004, tissue engineering meant you, you get a sponge, you make it from collagen or you electrospin it or now you 3D print it and you'll hear more about that technology um, to, to recreate that niche in that native environment. I think this is a very complex environment to, to try to engineer from scratch. Uh, the native extracellular matrix is highly complex, um, and we'll hear more about resolution, but the, this is just an example of an alveolar basement membrane where there's a, an endothelial cell, there's a red blood cell here, and there's gas exchange happening across this. This is what separates your blood from the outside world. It's less than one micron thick, so it's highly specialized. It's a, it's a very complex architecture, and the composition is not straightforward. It provides boundaries, architecture, attachment sites, and growth factors to cells. It provides essential mechanical properties. So the heart, as you know, is not just a, a blob, but it's a spring. The lung on itself is a, has a very complex fiber network across its three dimensions, uh, and it translates mechanical activity from tissue to cells. Uh, the matrix evolves with development, uh, not only its shape, but a fiber direction. This is just a mouse heart developing from embryonic day 12 to postnatal day 2. You can see collagen fibers developing in this matrix, and its composition changes. So uh, it's an adaptive structure that changes throughout uh, development and that changes throughout life and disease. This is just a cross-section of a pulmonary fibrosis lung uh, showing you how if there's too much matrix, you end up with scar, you're not ending up with any sort of regeneration. So the question in 2004 was can we, can we instead of synthesizing this artificial matrix, can we actually uh, derive it or somehow isolate it from cadaveric organs? And that we accomplished through a process called perfusion decellarization. Simple process taken cadaveric organs and perfusing them with uh, detergents, uh, washing out all the cells, and then the, you end up with an extracellular matrix scaffold that, to a certain extent, mimics that niche that is so important that I mentioned before and consists of extracellular matrix proteins. We went through a bunch of different chemicals, ended up with something that worked, uh, SDS and Triton X is a specific mix of detergent. And what you end up with here, what you see, this is a decellarized rat heart, is, is an empty shell of that organ. It still has the shape of the organ. Uh, most importantly, it has a vascular network of basement membrane that is preserved. So you have perfusible channels in it. Um, it has, um, has an empty basement membrane without any cells. Uh, and we've done quite a few experiments now, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow, that this can be translated to human scale. So this was sort of a glimpse that we are actually able, instead of synthesizing the matrix, we're able to isolate it from cadaveric organs. So in 2005, we then asked, well, can we build functional tissue in this? Going back to the principles of tissue engineering, where you combine an extracellular matrix with cells, you put them together in some sort of contraption, can you get to functional tissue? And this is, this is the sort of contraption. So if you think of organ regeneration, not just tissue, but organ, you need to do a lot more environment, a lot more stimulation than just, uh, than just having the, the, the sponge float in a dish. This is a rat heart being perfused in a bioreactor. So this is the third important term here, stem cell, niche, stem cell, niche, and bioreactor. A rat heart in one of those bioreactors where it's electrically stimulated and it's stretched to provide that, those environmental signals for cells that are then seeded onto it to engraft and form tissue. Uh, what we found then was that we were able, within only eight days, we take fetal cells and they actually uh, aggregate, they grow together into functional tissue. Of course, not at the function of a mature rat heart yet, but early contractions in the function of the organ level. This key here is that this was blood perfusible. Uh, of course, it clots off. The vascular system is not endothelialized, so that's been a, a lot of our work of the last four years was to figure that out. But it's something that can be surgically handled and can be transplanted. And I'll show that in, um, in, in another video that's more important even. In 2008, we started to think about uh, can we apply this to other organ systems? And what we did is um, try this with lung. This is another one of those bioreactors um, where uh, a lung is taken through a decellarization process, a rat lung, then repopulated with epithelial and endothelial cells, and then perfused and is taking its first air breaths after a period of liquid ventilation for a time. 
And this model we were actually able to transplant. So uh, I think this drives the point home from tissue engineering to uh, where an outlook is towards organ regeneration, where we take a bioartificial lung. So this is a lung that has been completely acellularized, then seeded with new cells uh, within eight days of culture, got to the point where we can actually transplant it. It's perfused by the recipient's blood, um, a blood supply here, the pulmonary artery pumping a dark blood into it. There's uh, pink blood coming out of it, uh, and there's uh, air ventilation happening through the bronchus. So uh, an important point to drive home that if we use the right niche and we use cells, we can potentially get to something that can be implanted. Uh, and you see here that's just a fluoroscopy of that lung being ventilated in the rat's body. So um, last or a couple of years ago now, we did the same thing with kidney. Again, proof of principle showed that we can regenerate functional kidney tissue based on this scaffold. So the, the summary here and the important points are that regeneration depends on the stem cell and on the niche. Um, the third component that's not up there is the environment and the bioreactors that we have to build to provide the stimuli to guide this, the stimulation to guide this process. Regeneration in vivo in us is limited, but it provides very interesting model systems. The NEWT model, while it's, it's very PR, uh, it's interesting from an EPR perspective, and the promise that it's all hidden in our genome that we can do this, might actually not apply. But there's more real systems, such as respiratory epithelium, gut epithelium, that, that show us how regeneration can happen and can occur. Tissues can be engineered ex vivo, and that has been shown you know, since the original publication in 1993 in multiple trials uh, up to clinical application of, of more or less two-dimensional tubular tissues. Tissue grafts have been successfully transplanted in these studies in the clinical situation. Organ scaffolds can be isolated from cadaveric organs, so taking that step from a two-dimensional tissue to a whole organ system is possible right now by using perfusion decellularization as a platform technology to generate that niche, that exocellular matrix from uh, off a human scale. And functional organs have been transplanted in experimental animals. So we have generated functional lungs, um, functional kidneys, and functional pancreas, functional muscle, and functional hearts um, from acellular um, matrices that are reseeded with cells and then transplanted in small and large animal models. Um, so with this, I want to thank you for, for the attention on this day one. Uh, thank all the folks in the lab. Of course, this is only possible through, through uh, the hard work of these postdocs that you see there, um, through our funding bodies and our collaborators. Um, and I want to invite any questions, if there's time.